Good afternoon. Um, I'm Christine Chalk. I'm the program manager for the CSGF in Oscar back at DOE, and I will be moderating session two. Um, our first speaker is um, Brennan Keller from Princeton University, where he's studying geochemistry and geochronology. His advisor is Blair um, Shoney, and his practicum is at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and he will be speaking to us on geochemistry in the age of open data, new insights into the formulation and evolution of Earth's continental crust. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, first, just a few motivations for this research and for this talk. Um, the first one is uh, really basic, understanding how the Earth system works, uh, particularly on geologic timescales. There's a lot we don't know about this, uh, even today, um, but the Earth system is ultimately what keeps liquid water stable um, for billions of years, despite things like changing solar intensity. So um, it's important for uh, life in general and humanity. Uh, the second more for this audience is uh, as a case study of what can be done with uh, existing freely available data sets. Uh, in particular, um, most of the data I use comes from uh, the EarthChem repository, which is an NSF-funded open data um, portal. Uh, anyone can download uh, data from this on the internet. Um, so uh, there's a lot, of sort, a lot of things you can do with, with um, geochemical data, um, but to understand the, the more uh, the things that require more computationally intensive techniques, uh, it's very useful to first talk about the uh, just broad uh, background of uh, geology and plate tectonics, and that's mostly what this talk is going to be about. Uh, so plate tectonics is probably a familiar term to everyone, um, but exactly what that whole system involves uh, is many of the uh, features seen on this you know, schematic USGS diagram. Uh, so there are things like uh, a whole bunch of varieties of volcanoes, say um, hot spots like Hawaii, uh, arcs such as the Andes, um, but really some of the general features of this are um, continental and oceanic crust, where you have plates of continental crusts floating around on the mantle, uh, bumping into each other, uh, and overriding this denser um, oceanic crust. And there are a few sites in here where you get um, magmatism, uh, typically arcs, plumes, and rifts, uh, the things that actually cause magmatism in the Earth, uh, the first thing that might come to mind is increasing temperature, but this is actually not common on Earth. It, there are very few geologic processes that take uh, a whole rock and add heat and cause melting that way. But uh, most geological materials have, have a positive Clapeyron slope for the phase boundary between mineral and magma. So you can actually melt just as easily by decreasing pressure as increasing temperature. This, it turns out, is much more common. That's what happens at rifts and plumes. Um, you just have upwelling, decompressing mantle, following an adiabat at you know, relatively limited change in temperature, uh, so it melts that way. The third way, which is kind of what's characteristic of plate tectonics that you can't really get in, on a planet or in a system that doesn't have plate tectonics, is arc magmatism, where you're actually adding water to uh, the mantle. Water is carried by these subducting oceanic slabs, uh, is compressed uh, and boiled out of the downgoing slab, and the water actually water in the mantle basically acts like adding antifreeze to ice. It lowers the melting point, and you get magmatism that way. Um, so again, the, the sort of broadest order features are this low elevation uh, oceanic crust, high elevation continental crust. Um, the difference in elevation is ultimately driven by a difference in density and a difference in composition. Uh, so if you just um, Look at, look at the, the most common rock-forming minerals on Earth. You can put them in an order in terms of increasing silica content. So the most silica-rich ones are the lowest density. Uh, they have a lot of silica, very low iron and magnesium. Um, these are the things that make up more of the continental crust compared to oceanic crust and mantle being more towards the bottom of this. Uh, so the difference in elevation is driven by difference in density. Uh, so it can persist even in the face of erosion of the continental crust. Um, it turns out this is very useful that we have this difference in density because um, ultimately the silicate weathering feedback, which is sort of schematically illustrated by this reaction, but you can substitute other cations, um, is a silicate rock plus CO2 um, will produce a carbonate rock, something like limestone, uh, and silica, and it takes that CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, 
this happens primarily on the continents where crust is exposed subaerially. Uh, if you don't have subaerially exposed crust, it's harder to do this. Um, but this, this is really the predominant negative feedback that keeps liquid water stable on Earth over billion year time scales. So if, you, uh, if you increase your uh, carbon dioxide concentration, both indirectly and directly, you increase your silicate weathering rate, which decreases your carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. Um, but in order to have, in, in the face of ongoing erosion and a hydrologic cycle on Earth, in order to have exposed continental crust, um, you need to have the difference in density of continental and oceanic crust and basically a bimodal topography, a bimodal, bimodal hypsometry uh, of the crust. So, so all of these figures here are just for different um, solar system bodies, Mercury, the Earth, Venus, Moon, Mars, and Titan, uh, where people have measured uh, basically the radius of uh, that planet at different places relative to the geoid, so a gravitational equipotential surface. Uh, so, you know, not all planets have oceans, but that's the same idea, basically. Uh, and you can construct a, hit, uh, a histogram of where, um, at what elevations, uh, crust is typically exposed. Uh, Earth is one of the only ones with a, any sort of a bimodality to it. Uh, Mars has a little bit, which is actually remnant from an ancient impact, but this would be quickly weathered away uh, if Mars had any sort of hydrologic cycle. So it's this. Uh, Earth is really the only one that has this bimodality, which has led to proposals that uh, this is actually linked to plate tectonics. But um, it's, again, that's a little bit puzzling because when you, all these types of magmatism that I talked about, when you're melting Earth's mantle, which is uh, silicates, olivine, and pyroxene, you only ever get basalt out of that process. And basalt is sort of the magma that erupts at Hawaii. Uh, it's the characteristic you know, black lava type rock. Um, you only get, uh, you get basalt in I any of these settings, um, but in subduction volcanism, where you're adding water, this actually decreases the viscosity of your magma, uh, makes it easier to uh, crystallize out different minerals in a process known as fractional crystallization, and go from something like a basalt to something like a granite, which is you know, more like your average continental crust. Um, so that leads us to questions about how long plate tectonics has been going on if this bimodal hypsometry is crucial to liquid water on Earth. Um, and currently, there is a remarkable lack of any uh, consensus in the field. The proposals from uh, first plate tectonics only less than a billion years ago or before 4.2 billion years ago, um, and, and not much consensus. If you want to get some insight into this just by looking at the composition of rocks, sort of a, a a first order approach, um, there's not much to see looking at, here this is just sodium, one of the major elements, but uh, over the last four billion years, uh, it's kind of a mess. It's hard to pick out any, any trends that would tell you anything about the mechanism of tectonics at a given time. In contrast, if we look at something, um, in this case, this is uh, temperature um, in centigrade as estimated by oxygen isotopes from an ice core in Antarctica over the last 400,000 years, this is clearly a very different type of record than our whole rock sodium. Um, there are clear trends of glaciation and deglaciation that you can interpret based on you know, somewhat noisy but overall interpretable uh, data. The main difference here between the whole rock record and this ice core record is that the atmosphere and the ocean are very efficient at homogenizing their composition on these 400,000 year time scales. Uh, the crust does not do that. Um, if we want to get any sort of average trend out of this, we have to do the averaging ourselves, basically. Uh, geologists have been very hesitant to do this because when you spend a bunch of time going out into the field to get a rock, take it back to the lab and analyze it, it feels like throwing that data away if you're just gonna average it with a bunch of other data points. Um, but that, that's kind of our only approach if we want to be able to see fundamental ch uh, changes in things like mantle potential temperature or the style of tectonics through composition. Um, so uh, one approach that has become possible thanks to uh, open data repositories like EarthChem is to take a substantial proportion of all the published data uh, and search for trends in this. If we want to have a uh, representative average over the entire globe, though, uh, that might be a little difficult here because you can see uh, the data distribution is far from uniform. Some places are oversampled relative to others. Uh, there's only so much we can do about this, but uh, 
one useful approach that had not been tried before was uh, basically weighted bootstrap resampling. So uh, in areas where many data points are clustered together, each new data point is telling you less about the composition of average crust there than one that's, that's somewhat unique. So you can, uh, you can assign a weight to each data point based on the density in space and in time, where here A and B are just normalization constants based on, in, the, in our case, the total you know, 180 degrees across the globe and the total age of the Earth. Um, and the exponent here uh, is basically letting you choose how much you care about points that are nearby versus points that are farther away. Um, so you can assign a weight and then resample using that weight to determine uh, how often you include a given sample in your bootstrap subsample. Uh, so the approach we started using was uh, so, uh, draw a subsample, but since each, um, each analysis, um, each analysis has uh, substantial uncertainty in time and in uh, chemical composition. Gaussian noise is added to represent that. Uh, binned by your independent variable, in our case, age, uh, and then take the average of all those means to get a standard error of the mean. Uh, we weren't really sure if we would, oh yeah, this is raw data resampled, averaged. Um, we weren't really sure if we would see much in the way of trends. Um, at first, uh, rapidly they did become visible. Uh, without going into too much detail, we're basically looking on the right here, elements that uh, are not very compatible in the mantle. They would rather be in a magma that comes out of the mantle. On the left are ones that would rather stay in the mantle. So basically, you have to, to heat the mantle a lot to force out your compatible elements. Uh, and whereas if you have only a small degree melt of your mantle, your incompatible elements will be very concentrated in that. So this is basically just showing a declining mantle temperature over time, which is not too surprising because we know the Earth created hot and had higher radiogenic heat production in the, t in the past. Other trends are more surprising. Um, there seems to be a, a large change in uh, crustal differentiation at the end of the Archean, where all of these trends on the left here, again over the last four billion years, are based on composition of some element in your felsic crust, your things like granites relative to basalts. Um, and many of these changes coincide with uh, oxygenation of the atmosphere in what's known as the Great Oxidation Event, which is a separate story. Um, but our main question here about uh, how long has plate tectonics been operating, to answer that, we, re we want to remember this uh, characteristic style of melting for plate tectonics where you're adding water. Um, because when you add water, you add other elements along with it. Uh, in particular, you add elements that are more soluble in aqueous fluids, um, in particular elements with a uh, low charge to size ratio uh, are more soluble. This can be determined experimentally, so something like cesium, highly soluble, something like niobium, not at all soluble. Uh, so if, if we suddenly start having plate tectonics where oceanic crust subducts, um, the expectation is you see a, a sudden increase in slab fluid signatures um, in these elements that are being carried along by uh, water from subducting oceanic crust. Um, one common signature that's been used in the geochemical literature is niobium thorium, uh, where thorium is more soluble than niobium, but they both behave similarly in igneous systems, so you should be able to see some uh, some difference in the concentration of, this, of these two elements uh, if there were a large change in subduction-related versus non-subduction-related magnetism. That doesn't appear uh, to be the case. Similarly, no change in the proportion of rocks with what is considered arc-like versus not arc-like, plate tectonic versus non-plate tectonic magnetism. Um, but we can look at substantially more sensitive indicators than that. Uh, let's try rubidium, one of the most soluble elements versus niobium, the least. Uh, again, not much of a change. Uh, here we would expect a no, uh, magnets from a non-plate tectonic melting mechanism uh, to be down, way, way down here below one, which is not observed at any time in the last four billion years. Uh, similar to that, um, this so-called foliatic in index um, measures the way magmas differentiate in terms of iron and magnesium uh, in uh, a dry magma without much water, without water being added from subducted slabs, you expect values above 1.1 off the scale here, um, whereas in a plate tectonic setting, you expect more like 0 0.9 or 0 0.8, uh, which is what is observed the entire rock record. Uh, so this is relatively simple stuff, but it had not been looked at uh, in a systematic way. And based on that, I would argue that plate tectonics has in fact been occurring throughout the entire preserved rock record. 
Um, there's still a lot we don't understand, especially some of the details about um, crustal differentiation, and there's room for a lot more computational work here, um, especially because all these processes are happening billions of years ago, or uh, many kilometers under the crust, places we just cannot go. So our only approach is our simulation and inversion. Um, so there's a lot of work to do, but uh, uh, much of what I have done would not have been possible without the CSGF, so uh, thank you, and uh, if I have time for questions. <laughs>